Yes. Yes. <laughs> Are we replaying the song? <laughs> yes. All right. My bad. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Well, and all right. Thanks everyone for hanging out and happy Culture Cast Day. Welcome, welcome, Lauren Kleinman. I was just saying earlier, the diva and goddess that you are. Welcome to Culture Cast. I'm super excited to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Right on. Well, um, hey, Culture Cast, for those of you who are first time tuning in. I love to invite leaders from different industries to talk about how they've been able to create and cultivate cultures where others, in addition to themselves, can thrive, whether it's their family, their community, in small companies and large companies. And Lauren has got this amazing story to tell. I think, you know, I, I know I put your title in there. She is a one of the founding members of Ritual. Um, and she's also founded two additional companies where you're the CEO and co-CEO right now of both Dream Day as well as The Quality Edit, which is phenomenal. And the vibe with you, Lauren, this theme around living true to your values and elevating women doing that. I mean, I love it. So this is why we're here and I'm super excited. And so before we jump into what you're doing now, I'm really curious how did you get onto this journey of being this innovator and entrepreneur? So how, who is Lauren and where did you grow up and how did you get on this pathway? <laughs> Thank you again for having me. Such amazing synergies that led to me uh, being here. My childhood friend who I haven't seen in probably like 15 years led me to meet you, Marissa. So I feel like yeah. all the stars aligned in the best possible way. Um, yeah, I can start kind of with, maybe a little bit of my childhood, unless that's going. Yeah. Um, my parents were both entrepreneurs. Everyone on my mom's side of the family, which is who I was closest to, were all entrepreneurs as well. So kind of as a child, I saw that it was really like the only path that I personally knew. Um, I got into entrepreneurship as a child. Um, I was probably like 10 and my um, uncle was in the import and export business. And I noticed that at the time, Razor scooters were sold out at Sharper Image, but all, everyone in my school wanted a scooter. So I nice. talked to my uncle. He ended up helping me import knockoff Razor scooters, which I ended up developing business cards for, selling all over uh, my school campus, riding it around the mall, selling it there. Obviously, I did all the other traditional things like bake sales. I created a classroom out of my garage and tutored all the kids in my neighborhood. Oh um, my goodness. I imported like Tamagotchis, uh, inflatable couches, all with the help. Wow. Of so it, it goes deep. Um, and I've always kind of just had the urge to, you know, be building things and, and I guess also be like selling things. Um, but I just always kind of was really excited and, and felt it was really empowering. Um, I, uh, went to school here, um, in LA studied communications and kind of out of that, I ended up, my first job was at a startup accelerator. I got to see companies from inception, you know, with one team member to what we had as kind of like our demo day where they go out and, you know, yeah. present to, um, investors and, Basically, through that experience, I ended up meeting my next employer, um, Walter Driver, who was a CEO of uh, and co-founder of a company called Scopely, mobile gaming company, went there a year after, was there for four years. 
Um, also just amazing experience. I feel like I got incredibly lucky to work alongside him, who I saw as such a relentless visionary yeah. in, in his own right. And I feel you know lucky to just have been surrounded by people that instilled a lot of amazing values culturally for me very early on. Um, and then after that, I met Katarina Schneider, the CEO um, and founder of Ritual. And um, for me, you know, I was super passionate about health and wellness and mm -hmm. a bit more than mobile games. And so making that transition um, was an amazing one. And, you know, it was it was kind of each of my transitions were scary. It was like, OK, I have like a you know cushy job, but um, my husband pushed me. I pushed myself to try to get outside of that comfort zone. And every time, you know, it ended up working out well. And then I was at Ritual for almost four years. Um, left to start my own uh, two businesses with Dream Day and the quality edit. Um, and, you know, I think in each of those career transitions, like never really looked back. I think each was so um, instrumental for like my own growth. And, um, you know, luckily so far, knock on wood, have, have turned out to be great decisions. I love it. Oh, my gosh. There's so much to unpack. Let me go all the way back to childhood, first of all. What did you brand your own scooters? Since you there were no Razor scooters, how did how did you brand them? Do you remember? That's such a good question. I've never been asked <laughs> that, but I don't think they had a brand. It was okay. just no name brand knockoffs. Um, I don't even remember. I like. I wish I had those like cards. Like, did my card say my name or was it like? A, That's hilarious. I think they probably just said my name and like my phone number, or my home phone number, or something like that. They were not professional, but you know, my, for my tutoring business, like my mom had a copy machine and I tried to use like the tools in her office. I remember i made her take me to the teacher supply store and yeah. copied, used her copy machine to copy all these packets of teacher supplies. So I don't know. I just made use with what I had, but I don't think it was as zipped up as like, you know, making my own razor brand. <laughs> I hear you. I love it though. I think hearing you talk about the kinds of things that you imported with the help of your uncle, whether it's um, white label, like razor scooters, yeah, yeah. Tamaguchis or um, blow up couches, all of those things, you were, you had your finger on the pulse of culture, right? And I think about what the kids those days, you know, yeah. your your community, your peers were really into, and you're able to figure out how to fill a need. I love that. And then the oh, tutoring yeah. thing. I mean, that's like early leadership. The <laughs> fact that you want to serve others and charge them, by the way, right? <laughs> to tutor them, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's funny, great. I've never reflected on those experiences uh, deeply or in that way. But um, yeah, I think you call out some some good points. Um, well, it's it's funny. It's interesting when I meet just natural leaders and to hear your story specifically how your parents are entrepreneurs and then you yourself just figured out back then even if you knew what the word zeitgeist was like what was going on yeah. you know and the vibe of what people were kind of gravitating towards it feels like it's been who you've been and then here you are fast forward i love hearing this career trajectory and um i always share this with people too so a couple of things that i heard too one is, look, you had leaders who were great mentors to you. And to have that diversity of background of actually going to startups, I think that is high risk. And I also am a nerd. I've worked at a startup or two before, which have also led me to big brands. I think that skill set and the experience that you had specifically, actually, that startup experience where you have to roll up your sleeves and pretty much do everything. I think that's a skill that's now needed these days. And, you know, no more can you find companies where there's layers and layers of people. You've got to have a leader who not only has the skill, but also has just the empathy, you know, to support people. So it sounds like you did that. Uh, yeah, I tried to. It's interesting kind of hearing how you frame like the leadership from mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a child, because I don't think, I don't, I, I, I acknowledge that I think some of that leadership was like inherent. It was part of my, you know, family. Like I did grow up in that environment, but honestly, it took me all of the steps in my career to be the leader that I am today. And I'm still obviously not a perfect leader and continuously trying to be a better leader every single day. 
Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that it's not like something that you have or don't have. Yeah. Like, there's, you know, certain like traits that might make you a better leader than uh, others. But I think it's interesting because it's taken me time and practice and, you know, doing a, a, a live cast or a podcast or even speaking publicly, like yeah. my first job, I wanted to quit when I had to speak in front of a group. Every time I had to speak oh, wow. in front of a group, I was like, this is going to be like the last day that I work here. Like it pained me so much. And I think leaning into those areas of vulnerability and the things that you are scared of is what makes you grow and is what has actually conquering those fears has made me feel more empowered as a leader. And it's kind of this like vicious cycle of I feel more empowered, I feel more confident, and therefore you end up becoming a better leader. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to call that out. No, I I'm, I'm glad you called it out. I also love... Um the risk taking and being uncomfortable as, you know, recognizing that as a way of developing your skills. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think about the same thing when you say, God, when you had to get up in front of people, I'm like, am I going to do this? I'm going to quit my job. I remember the first times that I actually had to get up in front of a lot of people yeah. and make a presentation, how nervous I was and yeah. how people knew how nervous I was actually. <laughs> yeah. And it was that, um, experience and the feedback that just helps you get back up again. And I also love this fearlessness though, that you talk about in taking risk that it's kind of addictive. Like once you do it, it yep. just empowers you to do it even more. Cause I hear you talk about too, you've never looked back every time you've made a move. And I think about, um, Scopely, for example, and mobile gaming, dare I say, and, uh, and I've, I've also worked in the gaming sector, I mean, it's for the most part, it's probably different today, very male dominated. And yeah. so to navigate in that, I don't know, can you talk about that? Because I think about then moving to a kind of women founded company, like yeah. what the contrast with that? Yeah, that's such a good question as well. Um, yeah, I was, I was pretty early on in the company. Um, the company just sold actually this year, like eight years later. It was, Oh my goodness one of the largest gaming exits, like I think of like all time, it was pretty like um, incredible and epic. And again, I take that as testament to, uh, you know, leadership. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. I was definitely one of the only like women, um, you know, I was in communication, so um, I wasn't in like engineering, yeah. but Still, because it was such a small company, I sat next to all men pretty much all the time. I remember back in the day, like all these engineers sitting there were like buying Bitcoin. And I was like, oh, oh wow. Yeah, I was like, what the hell is this Bitcoin? <laughs> thing? Now they're all like multi, multi millionaires on Bitcoin because they all were doing it. And I don't know how this answers your question, but I do think yes. there's to like, like, I wish the guys would have been like, hey, Lauren, you know, you should buy some Bitcoin like back in the day, you know? Yeah. I feel like it's such a, um, it speaks to kind of the walled garden around cryptocurrency. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, I guess maybe that being like a bigger signal of, I think sometimes, um, I don't know, sometimes you you feel a little bit left out. But I, I do think that the culture there was one that valued women. Um, That's great. Not to say that everything was always perfect, but um, I think going to ritual, like it, it, that going to ritual was so much easier because again, like I liked mobile games. I played them. I thought they were fun, but it wasn't like my true passion in yeah. terms of something that was really like, you know, ingrained in me and wanting to help other women and, and being, you know, curious about, diving into the intersection of health, wellness, science, and how do you build a brand around that, that people are going to trust, people are going to, that will be a brand that sustains for many, many years. So that, um, you know, while it was still a risk going from a company that's really established to what was just, you know, me and Kat, yeah. um, it felt much more aligned with my values. And I think once you, when you, whenever you have those like, taps or knocks of your intuition being like, there's something here I need to explore. Yeah. I think even if it doesn't work out, even if ritual hadn't worked out, it would have been the right move, I think. Um, because if you don't follow your intuition, like I just think you gotta, 
life is short. You, you got to yeah. do whatever is calling you. Well, I love that you say that about following your intuition, which if people are still honing in on what their values are and, and, or what is their calling from a career or life standpoint, yeah. you know, you feel it in your gut and your heart, right? Like it's just something that's telling yeah. you to point a certain direction and grab onto something. And then I think about, it's interesting hearing you talk about Scopely and I love this. Actually, I, I see that someone had just commented that she's here, Zainab. Some of that I actually knew at another brand. I ran into her a couple of weeks ago and she and I had the chance to um, coach up and coming C-suite people for Fortune 1000 companies. I'll just say that. Oh, and it's interesting when you talk about, you know, you're in charge of communications, but you're sitting around engineers and there's all these new things that you're kind of listening into. And they were also kind of peer mentoring you. I think, again, going back to the notion of leadership, leadership is not only just the technical trade that you you know need to hone in on as a leader but it's that ability to step back and see broadly with the company yeah. and actually connect the dots with what yeah. other people are doing and it sounds like you were in a role of course to do that you may not have been an engineer right, however right. it is about how do you communicate and you know it internally or go to market with what scopely was doing but then with ritual how did you even so you talk about following your intuition and of course it went really well, <laughs> but how did you know, like how was ritual um, kind of the, the idea that you came up with, with your co-founder? Yeah. So I didn't actually co-found ritual. I was part of the founding team oh, okay. with Kat, but I was our, our VP of marketing and, um, but Kat was a sole founder. But, okay. Um, so I didn't come up with the idea, but I joined very early on, you know, before we had um, a brand and before we had a lot of our positioning, we didn't have any like packaging or um, any of that. So I helped kind of solidify uh, and develop kind of each of those. And then later in my career with Ritual, moved on to some really interesting and like innovative um, partnerships, specifically around partnering with publishers and leveraging editorial and advertising, which also became part of the inspiration behind the quality edit, which I yeah. also now I'm a co-founder of. Um, but, um, you know, I was always really intrigued by Kat's vision. Um, she was or she is a mother and she yeah. started the company when she was three months pregnant and she couldn't find a prenatal vitamin that she trusted. They were all like, you know, with questionable ingredients and colorings and fillings. And these were the vitamins that her own doctor was telling her to take. And similarly, oh, wow. I had always taken vitamins my entire life. Um, but when Kat asked me, so what vitamins do you take? I couldn't think of one brand. So oh, I wow. realized like a huge aha moment for me. We actually walked through the streets of Melrose in Los Angeles asking women, what vitamins do you take? Oh, I take, I've taken the same vitamin for the last three years, but I can't remember the name. I don't even know what's inside of it. So I think that idea of like adding transparency, but also yeah. creating a brand that has a real community that people can trust, can understand what they're putting in their bodies every day, like was really compelling to me. And it was like, it like, you know, hit me square in the face of like, there is an opportunity here and there is a lot of white space in this very big category that is like a dinosaur category with all these legacy players that I'm not really meeting the the modern needs of women. Yeah, I think it's, um, I love how you were hitting the streets of Los Angeles to <laughs> do your focus group to understand who your, who your audience and who your consumers will be. Because I think about vitamins too, and it's like, it's the mass players who also have a vitamin category, I'll say that. And I know it's a big business, there's specifically yeah. vitamins. But what I love what you did, and I know that you you say this as part of um, your headline. It's like redefining the category, right? Yeah. For vitamins and more specifically for women. And I think you were ahead of your time. Yeah, Kat was ahead of her time in terms of her vision, but then how you all brought it to life. You yeah. think about um, and now this next generation that's coming into the workplace, especially how they want to be part of something that is purpose driven. You know, you Definitely. think about um, large shareholders for companies now holding companies accountable before they continue to invest more money in um, 
sustainability and yeah. social responsibility. And it sounds like you were doing that, you know? So, yeah. Ritual is um, incredible. Like just con constantly thinking of uh, more and more ways to be sustainable, to be eco-friendly. I think it was just like a couple weeks ago that they announced like the carbon footprint for yeah. each product, like publicly on the website and you know, that's always been really core to the brand. But I do think that now with like the modern consumer, um, I don't want to say a lot of those things are table stakes, but like if you don't, they are. yeah, if you're not a sustainable brand, if you don't actually have a good product, like if you don't have a good brand, if you don't have an authentic story to tell and reason for why this product yes. needs to exist, like, I don't think that you're going to survive for the long run. Um, and so I think, yes, it was like, early on to be like thinking of those things. But now these days, like those things are the bare minimum that I think you need to really, um, you know, get get the modern consumer um, interested. But just going back to ritual, one other thing I wanted to say, and it kind of goes into your question of like men, yeah. women, um, you know, I remember when when Kat was looking at kind of like the formulations that were in ritual or that sorry, that were advised to be in vitamins. It's like, well, how did we get to this place where we need you know, this much dosage of this specific vitamin. And she found that basically all of those studies were like from, and I might misquote this, but like 1970s, like studies only on men. Oh, no, no studies had been done on women's nutritional needs. So just like the whole, to your point on it, you know, the whole <laughs> industry being backwards and like, you know, innovating a new category, just like imagine that doctors are recommending vitamins that are based not even on the nutritional, you know, needs of women and what women might be, you know, already getting out of their diet, for example. So um, definitely a lot there. And I, I will say I have like a penchant for like wanting to uh, take something and make it my own. I think like yeah. we did that with Dream Day with our, you know, performance PR, um, you know, model, which is really innovative and same with the quality that we have a completely new kind of advertising model that we're doing there and so i think with ritual too is very intriguing just like i guess i guess there's like part of me that likes being the underdog and yeah. <laughs> likes you know doing something new and unique and innovative i find that to be really exciting yeah i love that and i'll also um and i thanks for that fun fact i had no idea in terms of vitamins were based on a, really a the men's needs back in the seventies, which is wild, you know, yeah. based on um, nutritional needs for the male gender. I'll just say that. But then I love that you use the word authenticity because I mean, when I, when I heard of you and had the chance to meet you, I'm like, wow, you look at everything that you stand behind. There's this authenticity to what you do and it feels real, right? It's based on what humans need. And in this case for ritual, what women need. And so I, I think you're right on in terms of what people want today is not only um, a brand, but the people behind it who can stand, okay. you know, stand for it. And just really curious before we move on to Dream Day, like how, I mean, how did you grow the company and how did you attract people to, you know, come and be part of this, especially because yeah. it was such a category creator. Yeah, uh, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> but I think, you know, it starts with, um, you know, Kat and her initial vision. And I think anytime you're working on a, you know, interesting challenge, you're going to naturally um, attract people. But I think Kat was also one of those people where she taught me so much about what it means to have an amazing culture. Yeah. And it's not about you know, I think a lot of more male dominated cultures are like, okay, like you're going to work till 12 in the morning, you know, every night and you're gonna work on weekends and we're going to have no boundaries, but you're going to get free lunch and you're going to get a ping pong table. And I remember that. <laughs> whatever. Like that is not culture to me, like yeah. culture and we can, I'm sure get into this later on the talk too, but like culture is living and breathing, you know, the values that you set for your company um, every single day. And I think Kat was really one of those people that instilled that kind of in me. And, and um, I think in terms of how we're able to at least grow yeah. the team, 100% was the culture, you know, that we built. Um, and in terms of attracting customers, that's a, a longer, yeah. uh, 
you know, conversation around all the different marketing channels. But actually, as, as it relates to what we're talking about, I think the authenticity yeah. was always there. It was always genuine. It was always real. It stemmed from a real need. And Kat was willing to put herself out there and, you know, stand behind it. Like, I, I just think we had so many copycat competitors that literally would use the same photographer, yeah. use the same image, use the same everything, like to a T, even the same capsules, the same pills, like, oh, wow. And it, it just is not lasting. You know, people, I think consumers are smart. They can sniff out when something is not real. And I think Ritual is one of those companies that have always embodied their values outwardly to their customers, yeah. but also inwardly, you know, with their culture. And that's what I think makes a company that can stand the test of time. Yeah, I love it. I love that you brought it full circle with not only the community inside, but the community outside. So the employees and the customers. And I love how you define culture. It is about living your values day in and day out and being consistent with it. And so, um, and I love that as a definition for values. I, I believe that it is about attracting people who have the same values too, right? Yeah. And so they wanna live that 24 seven, whether they're at home or contributing to a workplace. And it's not just about, I, I hear you, I'm laughing when you're like, oh, be here until midnight and we've got a ping pong table and free lunch. Yeah, that, yeah. that's not culture. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, but I love that you framed it in that way. And you're right, authenticity goes back to really standing behind it. And then the other thing that you're making me think of too, is that, um, and you're the expert, I'm just observing, but I think about brands, right? So outwardly, when companies define a brand to their customers, the popular question I love to ask when I'm advising CEOs today is, you know, everyone's kind of revisiting purpose and values um in this new day of working and they'll say here marisa here's like here's our new values or our new mission statement and i mean there's some really beautiful stuff out there and i'll just kind of say well that's amazing and this is really customer facing but if you put this in front of your employees or you talk to them about it do they feel that too and yeah. you know this one ceo said to me she's like oh, that's a good point no yeah. you know like we need to go back and figure out if this brand to, needs to be true, uh, the employees need to feel it. So that's part of culture too, right? 100%. I yeah. think that as a leader, you know, I try to be vulnerable. I try to be, I mean, I am human. So I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I try to own up to my mistakes when I do make them. And I think it's important for our team to know that, again, I said this in the beginning, I think like I'm not perfect. We're all yeah. learning and growing together. There's room for mistakes on all ends because we're all human. Um, but I think like you said, you have to walk the walk and being the most wholehearted leader you can personally be. And that inspires a team to really bring their best selves every day as well. And I kind of say like, you know, we want to encourage people to bring their whole selves to work. Yes. We'll go through breakups. People, you know, have health challenges. Um, people have passions that they want to pursue or, you know, trips that they want to take or yeah. whatever, like you can't expect someone to be a certain person at work and then turn off their laptop and be a different person, you know, in their home. So I think we try, uh, I think we, it starts with, I think you, um, as a leader, yeah. like being a good person, having good intentions. And I, I feel like that seems so obvious and trite, but I think that is really hard to fake. I think it's hard to fake yeah. really caring about your people. So we try to really actually care about our people. And then, like you said, from there, like clearly defining our mission, vision, values for the company, hiring other people who embody yeah. those values. And then most importantly, like you said, embodying those values every day, um, yeah. making sure employees needs are met. They feel seen, heard, understood Yes. If when times are tough or when they're getting a review, but as a leader showing up every day. And, um, that's really like half the battle showing up, being present, being yes. willing to be vulnerable, um, being accessible, um, I think is so important. And, um, yeah, we, we try, we definitely try to embody that. Um, I think we try to embody a culture that is collaborative, supportive, nurturing, and positive. And, you know, I think one good example, actually, without going on too much of a tangent is That's okay. I, um, 
I told my team that I wanted to do yoga teacher training. And okay. I was like, oh my God, are you trying to be a yoga teacher? Like, are you leaving us? Yeah. Like, no, I've just like for many years, I've wanted to deepen my yoga practice. And yeah. um, I feel like we're at a great place in the company where I have such amazing, you know, senior level support. Everyone is really firing on all cylinders on the team that I feel like it's, I had the, I felt like I had the ability to go and, and do that. And so I chatted about it with the team and everyone was like, so, you know, excited. But I think also interestingly, like one of our senior um, team members, our chief of staff, she was like, not only do I love this for you, but I yeah. love this for me because wow. I feel like it gives me the permission to, if I have something that I want to pursue, you know, be able to at least ask for that, be able to figure it out with you kind of like collaboratively. And that's how I want our team to feel like, again, we care about them as individuals and as people and, you know, not just as employees or like cogs in a, in a wheel. Totally. And I love that you went there. I love that you went there around your philosophy on leadership, because I always say that culture is also a reflection of leadership. And what I love that you're saying is, and it's pretty, it's not trite. I think it's come from a place of kindness, come from a place of like really caring and empathizing for and with people. You know, if all else fails and, and believe it or not, I mean, a lot of leaders are learning how to do that now. It's yeah. wild, right? I think about that. I love that you went there, that if you start from not only, yeah, bring your, your full self, as a leader, you need to accept all of that too. Yeah. Right? So yeah. it's not just like, hey, we have a culture where you can bring your full self. Yeah. It's only true when leaders actually want to embrace and see it all and, you know, and help direct the energy as needed. Right. And I, and I love too the example that you brought. I think that's why you posted posting something about um, your yoga teacher training. Mm -hmm. um, it, it reminds me of a little bit of just that vulnerability and that openness. When you share a goal with somebody, you know, they also want to be part of your journey. They want to hold you accountable. And yeah. I love too that your chief of staff, your, your one of your team members kind of said, and not only do I love it for you, but then it also gives me permission to go pursue my passion. Right. Yeah. And that it's okay to do that. I love yeah. that you shared that story. Yeah, she was um, like, I've always wanted to um, do, uh, you know, professional coaching, like career coaching. And I was like, yeah. let's like, figure out a course where like you can, you know, do that. Like as long as it's not like crazily interfering with, you know, your work, um, you know, here, like I'm sure she'd learn a million things that would be yeah. really valuable. And similarly, Absolutely. I, I feel with yoga training, the poses are like, 10% of what I've learned over the last week. Everything else is how do you better use your voice? How yeah. do you command a room? How do you show up as a leader? How are you embodying vulnerability? And that self-exploration, like I feel like, you know, makes me not only a better person, but, um, you know, a more empathetic and vulnerable leader to the team. I love that you're using those examples of yoga and with mm -hmm. coaching as well, because I think development and leadership skills can come from anywhere. And I'm going to nerd for just a second with you, but this is a great example of what diversity is to me. It's when you engage with, with a thing or a thought or, you know, an activity and then really be introspective about, okay, how does that translate to what I'm trying to do in my life? And yeah. I love, and, and, I love how you also brought that back to and how it's going to help others in your workplace first as yourself as a leader, but then what you might be able to bring to the table, you know, to help continue to drive innovation um, in your company. And, you know, what you're talking about reminds me of um, a leader that I've gotten to know pretty well. He's the CEO of Krispy Kreme. Here we are talking mm -hmm. about yoga and I'm going to bring in Krispy Kreme. But he, what I've learned from him and I, I'm stealing this shamelessly, so I'm going to own that I'm stealing it. But when he meets with people throughout his organization, he always talks about dreams and goals, right? So what are you dreaming about? And the fact that you're allowing people to pursue their dreams, but then he also talks about goals, like how are we working together to accomplish this goal for the company? And then he talks about love, you know, giving goodness and recognizing and being present with people, but then there's tough love, right? When it's like, and there's time when you have to give some tough love, yeah. right? To, to get people there. And so, 
I love that you went there. And um, I also love the vulnerability that you demonstrate as a leader. Uh, that that will get people to enroll in, in you as a human being. Like they're like, well, I want you to win too. And so yeah. that's amazing. Thank you. So um, let's talk about Dream Day. And I love this because you have coined this, it's not even a phrase, it's a thing that you do and now others are doing, performance PR. So let's talk about how you ended up founding Dream Day, but then what is performance PR? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I thought after I left Ritual, I was going to like take, you know, many months hiatus and chill and do nothing. And I quickly learned I'm not good at doing that. So yeah. Within the first month, I had chatted with a couple founder friends that I thought would be interested in, you know, basically I was consulting on everything under marketing and growth, um, started consulting for those companies and was so grateful that I had, you know, founders that believed in me right off the bat. I think that was definitely a blessing and maybe not, not usual, um, yeah. but I uh, started consulting for them and I realized that there was like a couple like very specific, more specific things besides marketing and growth that I had done at Ritual that were unique and innovative. And I realized that basically I had, I had managed all of the top PR agencies in the US pretty much during my time at Ritual, oh, wow. my time at Scopely, um, you know, was always managing different PR agencies. And I felt like they were all a lot of them, you know, great. Um, yeah. But I felt like they were only getting us half of the way there, so to speak, and that they were mm -hmm. maybe delivering the press, but not really understanding the bottom line in terms of the impact that press had on the company. Yeah. So the, whether that was, I don't know if you've ever received like a PR report, but a lot of times PR agencies will say, okay, we delivered, you know, 1 billion UVPN yeah. this month for you. And you're like, but I didn't see any traffic come through that article, or I didn't see any increase in revenue in my business. And there was this huge kind of like disconnect that was like staring me straight in the face. Um, because in parallel, I saw how publishers were evolving where they have yeah. editors, but they also have commerce managers. And the goal for the publication is not only to surface the most interesting brands and products, but also to um, surface brands and products that are going to help make the publication money um, and forge these basically like mutually beneficial relationships. Yeah. Similarly, I could not find an affiliate agency that I trusted with our brand. Felt like um, Ritual had very high brand integrity. We didn't do a lot of discounts and all the affiliate agencies also felt kind of stuck in the dark ages, you know, just turning on deal sites and loyalty sites, very yeah. cookie approaches. So um, through like, I don't know, a year of kind of like trial and error, talking to, you know, prospective customers, talking to my current clients, um, I realized that there was like a better way to do it basically. And so what we do now with performance PR is combining the best of PR with the best of affiliate marketing as part of one synergistic scope okay. to really meet the modern needs of publishers, but also in brands. So when we are, let's say, you know, pitching, we're not only sharing again, what's interesting and compelling, but we're sharing, here's an affiliate link. And this yeah. is how your publication can make money from our clients. And when we share our results with our clients, we can say, here's all the press we got you, but also here's how it's um, driving traffic and revenue and an actual, you know, return. Cause I think also, um, you know, managing agencies, sometimes you're doling out 10, 15, $20,000 per month. Yeah. And you're like, but what is the impact? So yep. not that our work is dollar for dollar impact, but at least we can start to see, hey, here's the top performing publishers for the brand. Here's the editors that like seem to really understand it. Here's kind of the angles that are like interesting and compelling that we should dive further into. And being able to, for me, as kind of a data driven person, yeah. understand that those data and analytics and be able to apply that into our work has been really impactful. And yeah, I think a lot of agencies now are like adding affiliate, you know, divisions and even some saying that they do like performance PR, which is all great. Cause I feel like, you know, all rising, what's the rising tide? All boats. <laughs> yeah. All rising tide lifts all boats. Wow. Um, so yeah, I think, um, but you know, it, it's, it's a very exciting time and space to be in because this landscape is shifting so quickly. And I feel like yeah. 
it was always ingrained from day one in our model. We're kind of the first to adapt. I love that. And I know that what was staring you in the face, as you said, mm -hmm. was like, hey, there's all this data. And I love that you are data driven. I think it's such a good lesson. So you've innovated in the PR space and has, have created this performance PR. I, I think that um, that example of you doing that can apply to any trade. You know, um, I think about people, for example, having been in human resources, and there's a lot of people who tune in here where you know, they are the people person for their startup organization or their large organization. And sometimes we overlook the value of data, you know, data that you can collect on um, your people and how it impacts both the top and bottom line and finding yeah. those correlations. So, and then you've turned that into a, like a business model. So I love yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, if you, whenever there's pain points, it's like, okay, figure out how to do it better or figure out how you, some, sometimes I consult, you know, entrepreneurs that are thinking about leaving their company and maybe they're nervous. And yeah, I feel like most of the time I try to give them the push and the confidence, um, like someone gave me when I was first starting, you know, consulting and then building an agency. Um, but I try to tell them like, what do you uniquely do well? Or what do you, you know, what, what kind of slant can you bring? Yeah to whatever is maybe more broad, that's going to make it uniquely yours. Maybe it's a niche of a type of client, or, you know, maybe it's more just around kind of the, the services. But I think if you are going to go out on your own, like you got to find something that obviously not only resonates and, you know, prove out that people want what you're offering, um, but ideally also have like a very specific niche that you can kind of claim as your own. That's awesome. I love that. And it is about differentiating, but also being authentic to who you are is what I'm hearing you say. But I, yeah. I want to hear too, like Dream Day. So why Dream Day? Like what's the, there's a, is there a meaning behind the name? There is. I love that you asked yeah. that question. Um, I don't get asked that that much, but um, I, it's pretty cheesy. So fair I'm warning. sure it's not. <laughs> So I, I have failed to mention this so far, but I'm a mom of uh, two kids ages uh, six and three. And when I was starting out, I and after I left Ritual, I was like, what do I want my dream day to look like? And I'm just nice. going to work back from there. And so it's funny because my dream day was like, I'm going to like, you know, eat healthy foods and make a smoothie in the morning. And I'm going to go for a hike and I'm going to work with a couple clients and, yeah. you know, and I'll be done by three and be home with the kids and be like super chill, perfect balance lifestyle. <laughs> and it's so funny because after I left ritual, like I had never worked as hard as when I started, you know, dream day. Oh and my goodness. And I actually experienced burnout, like uh, probably like a couple times, but oh, wow. <laughs> I completely overworked myself and it, it was my dream day because part of dream day also meant for me, I want to work with clients and founders that I'm inspired by. And yeah. as long as I'm passionate about what I'm putting out into the world, like I was really excited about that. So even though I was working really hard and even though I burnt out, I, was inspired. I wanted to be doing what I was doing every single day. And I wanted to, you know, show up and keep making it happen. I just took it a little bit too far. But um, yeah, it started with that. And I think what's been interesting about my journey is uh, you could say that maybe that wasn't what I had originally intended. Mm -hmm. It was my intention for a dream day, right? It wasn't like yeah. overworking myself. But I think as we've grown the team and as I've matured as a leader and as I've learned to like relinquish some of my controlling tendencies, mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm much closer to what I envision for my dream day and prioritizing my own self-care, prioritizing my you know time with my kids, prioritizing balance. Now, generally, like I have to let my nanny go at five. So I pretty much don't work after five unless it's something yeah. urgent that comes up and it's a quick Slack message. So I think I've grown up with the business as well and gotten better at, you know, my own boundaries. Um, and obviously owe that all to the team who, uh, you know, 
<laughs> like basically have have stepped up and you know allowed me to kind of not be doing everything on my own because obviously in the in the beginning it was just me. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. Now I I truly feel like I'm better embodying that idea of dream day every day. I love it. it it's your north star, and I hear mm -hmm. you in terms of like okay. I love how also this consistent theme with everything you've shared, it's like it, maybe not everything is perfect, right? Like you have this vision and then there's reality. And yeah. especially when you're starting something and you talked about being burned out. And I know that's um, an epidemic right today, I think in the workplace. Uh, and I know people are now working flexibly and working, you know, remotely and or in you know, IRL with each other, but then burnout is a real thing. Like, how did you deal with it? <sighs> a lot of work, honestly. <laughs> and I feel like I, I had like a tribe. So I feel really grateful because I also acknowledge my privilege and having a therapist that was covered by insurance yeah. that I spoke to every you know week. I really started becoming religious about therapy during that time. Um, and it, it, I don't have one exact answer, but it was just like, decide what you want. For me, that was like better balance. And yeah. what small steps can you take every day? It's not going to be immediate and acknowledge that. And there's going to be ups and downs. But what small steps can you take every day to help you get there? I hired that chief of staff, you know, this year, she's made an incredible impact on taking so much off my plate and, um, you know, is so valuable um, within the company. So whether that's hiring, you know, other resources or, you know, people that you need to feel more supported um, or, um, you know, self-care, definitely like I prioritized and um, just, you know, one step in the right direction yeah. every day, finding things that give you pleasure, that, you know, give you joy that are not work and trying to do more of those things, trying to be more present with my kids um, it was kind of a, a working with a lot of different people and then um, hiring and prioritizing, you know, more self-care, which sounds kind of obvious. But um, I think the important thing is like decide where you want to go. Maybe it's like you create a vision board or yeah. it's just writing it down. Decide what you want your dream day <laughs> to look like and then work back from there. What what tangible changes do you need to make in your life? every day. Maybe for me, it was like, I started taking a lot more of my calls walking. Like oh, these are calls yeah. that my clients are not on camera. Why do I need to be on camera? Yeah. Let's just take them walking. And, you know, just a simple act, like getting, you know, 10,000 steps every day or making sure that I like, I have my water bottle, like drink yeah. a day. Like sometimes they're not the really complicated things. I think we, and we tend to neglect ourselves in really simple ways, sleep, hydration, nutrition. Yeah taking care of our soul, our spirit. Um, and so just integrating some of those things back in are what really helped me. I love that. I love too that you're talking about the holistic being like your overall mental, emotional, physical wellness. I think that's really important. And the fact that and actually, I think LinkedIn user, which might be Jeffrey, mm -hmm. might, um, is talking about prioritizing self-care and prior prioritizing family. I think it's important to then not have that burnout. So yeah. I think it's cool that you're you're sharing that. And thank you for being so open too about, hey, sometimes you need to lean on others. And the one thing too, I think about innovation, and I learned this from um, a friend whose name is Franz Johansson, and he wrote this book on diversity and innovation, which was called uh, The Medici Effect. And, and I'm hearing you talk about this, it's a consistent theme too, like it's those small executable steps. If you have a vision, like you're not gonna get there overnight and innovation doesn't happen in one try. Like, you know, and it's not linear. Like I think you have to try it and then check and adjust to get to that next level. And so I yeah. love that you're saying that too, in terms of not being burned out as an example. Um, and so you're running two companies right now. <laughs> So yeah. the quality edit, and I know you'd mentioned you got that idea as well when you were at Ritual, but t tell us about that. Yeah. Um, so I have an amazing co-founder, Lee Joslowitz, um, and basically we were both at Ritual together. Oh, and okay. And the kind of innovative things that we were doing and working with different publishers. Similarly, I guess, and somewhat to Dream Day, we realized that a lot of the top tier kind of 
older school publishers were not re really working with brands in like performance oriented ways. Yeah. Um, and together at Ritual, we were driving a lot of the most lucrative partnerships for the business. So for example, we were the first brand to forge any sort of, um, you know, advertising partnership like we did with BuzzFeed back in the day. Yeah. How successful that was. And then we tried to replicate kind of that model with other publishers. But what we realized was that a lot of them just didn't understand. And a lot of them had many like layers of approval and just were used to like working in a certain way and didn't really want to like learn. We were like literally having calls with publishers being like, you guys should really like monetize like this way and be yeah. a lot more it'd be better for you, be better for us. But it was just like very hard and they just like didn't get it. So in addition to us being uh, avid uh, consumers ourselves of like all these different cool direct to consumer brands and yeah. not feeling like there was a publication that really spoke to us um, in terms of those recommendations. Um, we also knew that there was like a more interesting kind of advertising model that we could build, but the publication to help brands succeed in that way didn't really exist. So um, together we built um, the quality edit about a year after I started Dream Day. And it started as just kind of like a passion project that we yeah. were working on on the weekends or on the side. And we got our first client, which was um, our place and which was a, a former client of Dream Days as well. And we kind of tried to test what we thought, you know, would be lucrative for them it basically like worked <laughs> in the first day, the first couple of days. So we were lucky to kind of validate that our model worked and have that, you know, buy-in from a, a brand right away. Um, and fast forward to today, our place has been like our longest customer and they've been with us for over three and a half years as an advertiser with us. Um, but I think, you know, yeah, having that kind of buy-in so early and that vote of confidence was just so important. And Again, just kind of one step at a time. It went from being a passion project yeah. and something we we're working on on the side to, you know, a, a real business. We, um, you know, quit her job about uh, a year later. Um, and obviously, I was already, you know, at Dream Day. So, yeah, yeah I spend my time between um, both companies. There's amazing synergies with both, and that yeah. they all work with a lot of, you know, amazing direct to consumer brands. Um, and both kind of are at the intersection of content and curation and conversion, um, but two separate and distinct entities for now. Yeah. <laughs> Although I think there's a theme there too, in terms of, and, and you mentioned this earlier about, you know, part of the idea behind Dream Day is also the people you dream of working with, the people that you want to be spending time with. And if people take a peek at like what's going on at Dream Day and those brands that you've helped to, grow and then at the quality edit what you've curated for other people it feels like um part of what you're doing too is just helping other people grow and helping these brands grow in the right way and then i think there's this level of authenticity too in terms of the brands that you that you're you stand behind right yeah yeah, yeah absolutely we we actually just did our first reader survey at the quality edit we found that 90% of our readers trust us for recommendations. Amazing. Um, which is really high. I, yeah. I was like, why well, not 100%? But <laughs> that's my perfectionism, which I'm working on. And um, no, like 90% I learned is like extremely high. So, and I think that does go back to like, we authentically will not back a product that we don't, you know, believe in, that an editor hasn't tried and loved. Um, and so, yeah, I think helping, you know, customers make better purchasing decisions. Yeah. Like I think there's so many products and brands now out there and being able to kind of summarize it for them in a way that helps them make more informed decisions um, faster, I think is, is, you know, we hope really helpful. Yeah, I think it's really important, especially these days with people pushing product and information through well, yeah. Facebook's kind of old, but Misinformation. Like Instagram, et cetera, like sending all that stuff. Like, I think it is about giving people information on yeah. and from a source that they can trust. And I love asking this question and it's almost like unfair to ask it, but I'm going to anyway. I always ask my guests like, okay, what's one thing that you're loving? Whether, you know, what are you totally into these days in terms of watching, eating, wearing, listening to, et cetera. Like, I'd love talking about just pop culture in general. Yeah. 
Um, honestly, I feel like I've, especially everything going out on in the world right now, yeah. like I try to limit my media sources right now mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a pretty empathetic person and um, it kind of cripples me if I let it go too far. Yeah. Um, I still tr try to stay informed, but I'm very cognizant, especially doing yoga teacher training of like what information I'm getting and what I'm kind of like allowing into my energy. Um, that said, there were two books that were re required reading our first week. So we had to read both books in a week um, that I highly recommend for anyone um, that is looking to improve their relationships, their uh, work, their leadership, um, just themselves yeah. in general. The two are um, Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. Pretty famous book. I'm not sure if you've yeah. heard it. Oh, yeah. Probably why a lot of I'm talking a lot about vulnerability because, you know, she really harps on the vulnerability and how important that is to have in kind of every facet of our lives. Um, and then also The Four Agreements by Don Ruiz Miguel, I think is his name. Oh, okay. Um, it's just like a great book that you can probably read like 50 or 100 times over the course of your lifetime and just keep coming back to these four agreements and principles that help you lead a really authentic, intentional um, life. Um, and yeah, I think both of those have just recently made a really big impression on me and um, you know, help me show up as the best version of myself and relationships and family and obviously with myself as well. Wow. I love it. So daring greatly, great book. And yes, Brene Brown is all around vulnerability. That's her, that's kind of how she made a stamp in mainstream, I think on what, how that's so important in life and in leadership, but the four agreements that's new. I'm going to look that up. I mean, yeah, that like, sounds like, yeah, very cool. Also, also a pretty big, big seller and it's very short. So you like, you could probably read it in a night or two. Um, but I almost feel like it's something you could keep in your purse and like just continuously refer back to. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, before we wrap, I'd also love to just say you've given so much wisdom and just have been a great example of, all right, be human, live your values and have a big vision for what you want to do and just take steps to get there. I mean, I, I'm thinking of the theme that throughout everything that you've shared, but if there's one thing people should be doing who are listening right now or who will be listening in the future to create a better life where they can thrive and others can thrive. What's like one more piece of advice that you want to give one thing? Ah, oh, I feel like I've shared all my nuggets. Yeah. <laughs> no, but um, actually I just told this to my friend this morning, like focus on being your best self. I, think I love it that. It starts there. Um, what lights you up, what gets you excited. And I think by living your best self and being the most authentic version of yourself, you not only realize your own potential, but you inspire others as well. Oh my gosh, what a way to wrap. Mm -hmm. I love this focus on being your best self. I agree with you. It starts with you and your authentic self and full authentic self. I love it. Well, Lauren, how can people get a hold of you? Um, where can they find you if they want to reach you? Yeah, LinkedIn is a great place. I'm great. Lauren Kleinman on LinkedIn, or my email is lauren at dreamday.la or lauren at thequalityedit.com. You can follow our social media, Dream Day LA, on Instagram or the Quality Edit uh, on Instagram as well. But thank you so much for your time. This was such an inspiring conversation. I'm so inspired by your background. I wish, I wish we could talk about that for an hour. I <laughs> want to know everything about how you got to where you are today. Oh my gosh. Well, maybe someday we can find yeah. the time to do that, but I am actually ending this with inspiration. I'm just so thrilled to have spent this quality time with you. And <laughs> so you. we're going to wrap with everyone. Thank you everyone for joining and Lauren, um, we'll see you soon. Bye everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>